sign up for our Coastline Marriage Conference. Encourage you to invest in your marriage. It's one of the best things you can do for your marriage. Even if you have a great marriage, uh, like like if you have a even if you have a great car, you still have to get an oil chain to keep oil chains to keep it running. Well, marriage conferences are kind of like oil changes. Even if things are running well, every once in a while, you need a little tune-up, you need a little oil change, you want to keep it on track because great marriages do not happen accidentally. They happen intentionally. And we've got John and Helen Burns. They host a show on the Hillsong Network, Love, Sex, and Relationships, Pastor Great Church in Vancouver. And we're thrilled to have them in for our marriage conference. It's going to be a night that it really will be very, very beneficial to your marriage, whether it's great or whether you're hanging on by threads. God has a chance to either make it better or do a miracle. And we're believing that at this marriage conference this year. So check it out on our website. Today we start our small group semester. If you look at your message notes, I want to invite everyone to pull out your message notes. The second page of your message notes is the small group discussion guide. If uh, you're not, what we encourage you to do is just continue on with the small group you are a part of during the fall semester. If you weren't a part of a small group during the fall, Just get three or four friends together this week and talk through the notes. You don't even need a small group leader. Just go through the discussion guide and watch how God will show up in the middle of it and guide the conversation without even a leader to be there. Because being a part of a small group is so much easier than people think it is. It's just getting together and talking out what you're learning. In other words, this is the lecture, small group is the lab, and you need both. Uh, in education, when you're trying to study to be a doctor, you got to have lecture and lab experience before they ever let you work on you know, living patients. And that's what this is. It gives you a chance to hear the message and then go work it out and talk it out and figure it out. So start a small group. If you don't have a small group, grab some people that you like, that you enjoy being around with, and get together every week and just go through the discussion guide. We'll help you. We'll empower you. If you want to find a group, talk to our team today. We'd love to introduce you to some people in the church. We have great groups meeting all week long. We'd love to get you connected and make some introductions for you to help you navigate that process and find the one that fits you best. And then as always, every semester we have two options. We have small groups, which are based on the notes from Sunday, and then we have freedom small groups every semester. And the way we put it is if you've never been through a freedom group, we ask everybody who's a part of our church family to take one semester in your journey with us, 12-week commitment, it is a commitment to be a part of freedom, with a two-day conference at the end, and go through a freedom group, one of the best things you can do for your faith. We've had people who've been Christians for 30 years, solid in their faith, go through freedom and say, that was one of the best things I've ever done for my faith. I wish I would have done that 30 years ago because it really unlocks some things for people when it comes to Christianity. It helps you let go of some baggage from the past. It helps you embrace the way God really wants Christianity to work. So I want you to consider going online today, finding a group that works for you, and signing up and take the 12-week journey with us and be a part of a freedom group. But our desire is everyone in our church family be a part of a small group, either freedom or a regular small group. Everyone be a part of a group. It is one of the best things you can do for your faith. You need to have, and, and, and you know I don't like talking like this because I like to invite you to do things, but I'm just going to... Talk to you as a pastor for a moment. You need one another's in your life to do Christianity right. When you study the New Testament, those two words, one another, one another, one another, one another, one another, all throughout the New Testament, God makes an assumption you have those relationships in your life. Let me be very clear. You don't have one another's on Sunday in a crowd like this. This is far too large of a crowd for you to develop one another relationships. That's where small groups comes in, helps you develop those one another relationships that every person needs, every married couple needs, and, and your one another is more than you and your wife. Like, like it has to be more than just the two of you because you're going to fight sometimes. And there's going to be times where you're going through a difficult time and you're not going to figure it out on your own. You need some other one another speaking into your life, critical to developing our faith. Well, let's jump into the message. If you'll grab your message notes, we're in this series called The Daniel Dilemma, which is based off of a book that my pastor wrote last fall, Chris Hodges. The whole book is a playbook. It's a manual 
How do we live during today's culture, a world that seems to be going very, very far away from God? And the challenge that you and I are put into, or the dilemma as the book uh, presents, is how do we stand firm and love well? Because in the world today, culture wants you to choose one or the other. You either stand firm and nobody likes you and you're mean and people call you a racist and a bigot, or you take the other extreme and you love well and you kind of bend your convictions and compromise truth and you let everything slide and you, you, you actually believe this false narrative that you love people more than God loves people and that you would do a better job writing the Bible than God did writing the Bible and we need to change some things the Bible says because they're not socially acceptable anymore. And so we, we, we feel like we're caught in limbo. We're caught having to make a choice. What side do we, do we stand upon? It's an either or. And I want to say it's not either or, it's both and. Daniel, the entire book shows us that we can actually stand firm in what we believe. We don't have to compromise truth or our convictions. And at the very same time, we can live a life that doesn't make anybody feel judged, anybody feel condemned, anybody feel looked down upon. We can stand firm and love well. Last week, we dealt with the stand firm side of the, the, the message. How do we stand by convictions? How do we stand by truth in a world of compromise and a culture that, that is just decaying all around us? How do we stand by what we believe? Today, I want to deal with the love well side. Paul puts it like this, the only thing that counts. Let me pause and say, Anytime you see a phrase like that in the Bible, stop. That's not an ordinary phrase. Paul is very serious with what he's about to say. Like this is a stop, say la, think about it. This is going to be very, very important what he's going to say. The only thing that counts is faith or truth expressing itself through love. You cannot have faith without love. You cannot have truth without grace. We need to stand firm and love well. And honestly, we haven't always gotten this right as the church. We have a whole extreme of Christianity that's taken a very dogmatic approach, and it's made people feel judged. It's made people feel condemned. It's made people feel hurt. It's give people very warped views of who God is. You see, Daniel modeled this throughout the book of Daniel. And what we learn through Daniel and what we learn through the Bible is that God's solution to the world, all of the problems around us, culture falling apart, do you know what God's solution is? God's answer? You. You are God's answer to a world that is falling apart. You are God's plan. In other words, God created you to live such an attractive life to live in such a way that the world runs to you and says, we want what you have. You possess a quality that is different. The way you do marriage, it's different. The way you parent, it's different. The way you work, your work ethic, your integrity, it's different. We want what you have. Help us. God designed you to live a life in such a way. And when you study Daniel, this is exactly what happened in the life of Daniel. Last week, we dealt with one of the most famous stories in the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Today, we're going to look at some of the other story, Daniel in the lion's den, and kind of what precedes him being thrown into the lion's den. Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. It pleased Darius. Darius is the third king that Daniel served under. Third king. Darius was a Persian king. So what happened was modern day Iran overthrew modern day Iraq. Persia overthrew Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire. And so Darius is now king and Darius is, is the third that Daniel served under. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps, those are governors like of states, to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of them whom was Daniel. Very interesting to me. Because Daniel would have been the only one that was not Persian. Daniel was Jewish. 
And out of all the 120 governors who ruled the empire, Daniel became one of three set over them as a Jew. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. I love that. Daniel lived his life in such a way. He operated, conducted business and government affairs in such a way that the king thought to himself, if I put this guy over, give him this responsibility, I'm not going to suffer any loss. Everything he does, I can trust the way he does it. And if he's in charge, we're not going to suffer loss. Now, how did Daniel get to this position? What was it about Daniel that made the king pay attention and take note of him? It says, Daniel so distinguished himself. He so distinguished himself among all the other administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities. That's the title of the message today, exceptional qualities. In other words, Daniel didn't reflect culture, he set culture. Daniel was different than all of the others. He wasn't, he wasn't just like all the other satraps. He wasn't just like the three administrators. He distinguished himself. He differentiated himself. He had something exceptional about him that was different than everyone else. In other words, you can't make a difference unless you're different. Daniel was different. There was an exceptional thing about him. And again, God's hope for mankind is you. You are God's plan A. He doesn't have a plan B. God's desire is that you live your life in such an exceptional way that even in a very wicked, evil culture, you rise to the top with influence because of the exceptional qualities, because of distinguishing yourself. Daniel served under four different empires, four different kings, and in every single one of them, he rose to the top of influence. He rose to the top of the nation. He did it not by being a jerk or being obnoxious or, you know, being judgmental. He did it because he was exceptional. He distinguished himself to the point that the king planned to set him over the entire kingdom. No longer would he be one of the three. He would be one over it all. He was so exceptional. And this is my desire for you. I want you to know this is one of my prayers in 2018 for all of the business men and women in our church. All of you that are career people, I'm praying that in your workplace, in your career, you so distinguish yourself. There's an exceptional quality about you that your managers and your supervisors and the owner of your company says to themselves, I have to promote this person. Everything they, they do, there's integrity, there's character. I know if they're in charge of this division, if they're in charge of this department, if they're in charge of this branch, we're not going to suffer any losses. The way they conduct themselves is exceptional. There's something different. They've distinguished themselves. This is my desire for you. And I want you to know this is part of your witness. This is part of God's plan for your life. God desires this because this is how you change society. This is how you change the world. You distinguish yourself with exceptional qualities. And I want you to understand it wasn't just his ability, it was his character. It wasn't because Daniel went to the right business school and he had the right leadership training. It was much more than simple ability. Look what it says, that this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of governmental affairs with the way he conducted himself at work. But they were unable to do so. They couldn't find him cutting corners. They couldn't find him taking shortcuts. They couldn't find him showing up late and ditching out a little bit early. They were unable to find any flaw with him. They could not find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy. He was a man of his word. He was somebody that had integrity. He had character. He was neither corrupt nor negligent. I hope this could be said about you. My desire is this is how your, your boss, your supervisor, your manager, your employees look at you. Finally, these men said, we're never going to find any basis for charges against this Daniel 
unless it has something to do with the law of his God. The only thing we know for sure is he's not going to compromise his faith. The only thing we know for sure is he's going to stand by his convictions. When it comes to his work ethic, you're not going to find anything wrong with this guy. When it comes to his performance, you're not going to find any. There's integrity, there's character, there's excellence, there's work ethic, there's honesty. He doesn't take shortcuts. He, he, he doesn't, you know, doesn't you know, do shady business deals. He does all things well. The only thing you can say about him is he will not compromise his convictions. This is my dream for the people of Coastline Church. See, I pray that you understand you represent Christ in your workplace. People are watching you. People who know your faith, they're watching your work ethic. They're watching your performance. And that is just as much part of your witness and testimony as the words that you speak. Imagine what would happen if the world looked at us this way, where they could not find a charge against us, only solutions. And I know some of you are thinking to yourself, whoa, 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 that's way too much pressure for me right now. Like, I'm still trying to get my act together. That's why I'm here. Like, I'm the one that needs help right now. Well, can I tell you, that's why God brought the local church into your life to equip you. The very vision of this church is for you to know God because it all starts when your faith with him. And then once you know him, we want to help you find freedom because we all have some, some baggage from yesterday, some issues from yesterday that can affect our future. Then we want to help you discover your purpose to understand what you're gifted at, what God created you for, the thing that you do that's better than everyone else, and then help empower you to make a difference in all arenas of life. I mean, honestly, this is why we do the growth track. It is why we have small groups. It is why we empower dream teams. So what I want to do now is I want to take a deep look. For those of you that love going deep into the Bible, we're going to go really deep for a moment. And I want to dig out these exceptional qualities because we need to understand what, how did Daniel distinguish himself? What was it about him? What were these exceptional qualities that he had? Where did they come from? Well, I want you to look at Corinthians with me. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says, for the Lord is the spirit. And wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So here's the goal. We want to get the spirit of the Lord in it. Why? Because wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is breakthrough. There is miracles. There's going to another level. So if a marriage is struggling, we want to get the spirit of the Lord into it so that there's freedom. If a business is struggling, we want to get the spirit of the Lord into it so there's freedom. If your life is falling apart, we want the spirit of the Lord in it so that there's freedom, there's breakthrough, there's miracles. Wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's the goal. How? How does God do it? The answer, all of us. Again, you're God's solution to the world. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't reside in buildings like the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit resides in you. God's desire is for the Spirit to be in you in such a powerful way that everywhere you go, you bring freedom and you bring life. That's God's plan. He does it through all of us who have had the veil removed. That simply means you've been born again. You've been saved. You know God. The veil's removed. You don't have anything holding you back in your relationship with God anymore. So those of us who've had the veil removed, we can now see and reflect the glory of the Lord. That's how God does it. God's spirit resides in us so that you and I can reflect. We can reflect the glory of the Lord. Now, how does God do that? Well, the Lord, who is the spirit, makes us more and more like him. It is a process. It's not a one-time event. See, God wants you to reflect the, his glory. God wants you to reflect his likeness, to reflect his image everywhere you go. And he gets you to the place to do that because he makes you more and more like him. How does he make us more and more like him? Small groups. And I want you to hear my heart. I say this is, is with, with no self-serving at all. You study the New Testament. It is Absolutely crystal clear, 
God makes us more and more like him through the one another relationships in our life. Iron sharpens iron. If there's not another piece of iron, you're not going to sharpen yourself. You're not going to be made more and more like him. It does not happen in a classroom setting like this. It does not happen in a large group experience like this. It does not happen you and Jesus on your own. He makes you more and more like him in one another relationships. This is why we are so passionate and driven about small groups in our church because God uses small groups. He uses relationships to make us more and more like him, which is his plan for the world. This is God's solution to society falling apart is that you and I will be made more and more like him so that we can reflect his glory as we're changed into his glorious image. So every day I am becoming more and more like Jesus. So here's the point. If we're gonna make a difference in the world that we live in, we need exceptional qualities. We need to distinguish ourselves from everyone else. And those qualities must reflect Christ. In other words, Christ is the standard for the exceptional qualities. The more Christ-like we become, the more like Jesus I look, the more I reflect God's glory, the more more Christ-like I become, I am not going to offend the world or turn people off. It's actually the opposite. I'm going to attract people. I'm going to draw people. Look at Jesus. Sinners loved Jesus. Religious people couldn't stand him. Sinners loved Jesus. They were attracted to Jesus. So if we want to love well, we got to stand firm, love well. If we want to love well, we got to understand God is love. God doesn't have love. He is love. Jesus is love. So the question is, what does Christ look like? If I'm supposed to reflect Christ, if I'm supposed to be made more and more like Christ, what does he look like? Because when you study what he looks like, it's exactly what Daniel exhibited through the book of Daniel. Well, the clearest picture of the glory of God, the clearest picture of Christ in the Bible is actually where we're going next week in the book of Revelations. Next week, I'm going to take the last six chapters of the book of Daniel, all of the end times prophecy, and I'm going to build an outline of end time events, and I'm going to show us where we're currently at on this timeline and kind of what's left to come. So you don't want to miss next week because it's an end times message that's going to be very, very interesting. But the clearest picture of what Jesus looks like, John had a vision in Revelations of the throne. And in the center of the throne, he sees the glory of Jesus. He sees, he sees the Jesus, the glory, in the best of his ability, he tries to describe it in our human language. And here's what John says in Revelations 4. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, in the center where Jesus resides, around the throne were four living Creature. So in the center where Jesus is, right around that is, is what, what, what he describes the glory looking like. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Now, when you study scripture, theologians tell us, and I believe that these represent what Christ looked like. John is doing his best to describe what the reflection of Christ, what the glory of God looked like. Most scholars actually believe that these correlate to the four gospels too. You study the book of Matthew. Matthew talks about Jesus all throughout the gospel of Matthew as the king the coming king, the Messiah, the king. Matthew is the lion, the king. Even when you study the genealogy of the book of Matthew, it goes all the way back to King David. It it accentuates that, that Jesus is the fulfillment of David's kingdom. Mark is the ox, the, the epitome of being a servant. Mark has no genealogy because a servant does not need to be known for where they came from. A servant just serves. They're, they're behind the scenes. All throughout the Gospel of Luke, Luke uses the phrase, son of man, son of man. And when you study Luke's genealogy, it's different than Matthew because Luke brings it all the way back to Adam, the first man, the face of the man. John's genealogy is very different from Matthew 
and Luke. John is the eagle. John's genealogy says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. The, he, he came to earth, the, the eagle. You see that through the four Gospels. So here's the goal. Your, your goal, God's goal for your life is for you to reflect the glory of Jesus, for you to be made more and more like him. And this is what it looks like. You are to look like a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle. That's what you are to look like. So the theory is if this is what we're supposed to look like, then I need to figure out what in the world this means. Now, I know some of you think I've gone a little bit over the deep end right now, and like, like you've just gone way, like, you're reading into the text way too much. Let me show you it one more time. Ezekiel also had a vision of the glory of God. He had a vision of Jesus. And look at what Ezekiel said in his vision of Jesus. Each of the four had the face of a human being, and on the right side, each had the face of a lion, and on the left, the face of an ox, each also had the face of the eagle. At the end of the vision, he says, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. This is what it looked like. When, when I saw Jesus and I saw his glory emanating from him, this is what it looked like. So the thought is if we look like these four, then we look like Christ. We represent Christ. We reflect his glory God can use that to change the world. And when you study the book of Daniel, these were the four exceptional qualities that Daniel had. You see every single one of these in the book of Daniel, and they're what elevated him to the position of authority he had under four different evil empires and four different wicked kings. So let's look at what these mean. The first one is the ox. The ox is the face of a servant. When you look at the Bible, the Old Testament, the ox carried things for other people. The ox plowed fields for other people. Oxen were sacrificed for the sins of others. They didn't do anything wrong, yet the ox had to die because of somebody else's sin. The ox was the epitome of being a servant. The way to people's hearts is serving them. Yes, amen. You're not going to preach anyone into heaven, but you can serve. That's why I said, Jesus said, let your light shine that we see your good deeds, not that we hear your good words. We did an entire series on this in the month of December called Doing Good, all about serving. It's, it's our great honor to serve. It's our great honor to look like an ox in the world today, to be servants. One of my pet peeves in life um, and we've actually outlawed this phrase from our leadership vocabulary and our staff. So if you've ever hear any of our staff members say this phrase, call them out on it and give you permission. We've outlawed the phrase because it just, it, dry, it's a, it drives me crazy. Every time you say thank you to someone and they, and they respond by saying, no problem. Well, why in the world would it be a problem to serve somebody? Like, why would you even assume that it was some kind of problem in the phrase? It's never a problem to serve. It's always an honor to serve. It's always a, a joy to serve. There's not even the thought or assumption of being a problem. I learned this from a friend of mine who's an executive pastor in Texas. He was traveling on business, and he teaches a lot on leadership. And he was staying at a Marriott courtyard. And then a few weeks later, he was staying at uh, a Ritz-Carlton resort. And he was describing the differences. And it didn't have anything to do with their amenities or their facilities or the price tag. He said, here's the big difference. He said, at the Marriott, I was going to get a workout in the gym, and I go to the front desk, and the manager was there that afternoon, and I stopped by the front desk, and I said to the manager, I said, you know, I know you're busy right now, uh, don't want to take any of your time, can you just point me in the direction of the fitness center? And the manager said, yeah, sure, it's down the hall, third door on the left, barely looking up. He said, thank you. The manager looked at him and said, no problem. A couple weeks later, he's at a Ritz-Carlton. It's a resort, multi-building, big acre property, He's lost, confused, can't find the building where the fitness center is in, walking around. All of a sudden, he sees you know, a guy walking with a big stack of papers. The guy is obviously in a hurry, looked like he's on his way to a meeting. He says, look, I don't want to bother you. Found out it was the manager. He goes, I don't, I don't want to bother you at all. Um, I know you're busy. I know you're going somewhere. Can you just point me to the building where the fitness center is? He said, absolutely not. I'll walk you there myself. The manager 
uh, late for a meeting, stopped what he was doing, walked him to the fitness center, gave him his personal cell number, said, anything you need while you're here with us this week, don't hesitate to call me personally. We're here to take care of you. At the end of it, my friend said, thank you. The manager said, no, thank you. It's my pleasure. So one of the things we've required our staff to do is you can't respond by saying, no problem. You've got to say, it's my pleasure. Because <laughs> how many know it's a different culture? It's a pleasure to serve. It's a pleasure to be an ox, to look like Jesus. You get a chance to do this this week. You get a chance to do this tomorrow morning. On your way to work tomorrow, you can stop by Lucadia Donuts because the fast is over and you get a big <laughs> box and bring them to work and just love on everyone, serve them at home, in your neighborhood, at work. See, this was Jesus, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served. No, he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And I know it's not always fun. I know it's, you know, it's, sometimes it's hard to go the second mile, but it changes the world. Look what Paul said. Though I am free and I belong to no one, I've made myself a servant. I've made myself an ox. I've made myself a slave to everyone. Why? To win as many people as possible. I'm trying to change the world. I'm trying to have influence. I'm trying to win people to myself so that I can win them to Christ. I'm trying to live a life in such a way people are attracted to me and they're attracted to the Christ that's in me. Isn't this a stark contrast to the way the world sees the church? Let's change the way they view us. Let's live like an ox. The second is the man. The man is the face of love. The man is how we relate, how we connect to other people. And the way we connect and the way we relate is love. And unfortunately, we got a whole group of Christians today that, that they're just ignoring love and they just want to you know, try to win people through a doctrinal debate. Like we're going to argue people into heaven. We're going to beat them over the head with truth and we're going to be so mean and ugly about it that they're going to give their life to Jesus. I mean, no, they're not. You're not going to argue with anybody over Jesus and beat them over the head with truth. And at the end of it, them say to themselves, you know what? The light just went on. I'm giving my life to Jesus. It's never going to happen, folks. It doesn't work that way. It's all about love. You know, when I first came to the Dream Center in Los Angeles, first couple of years, I was really insecure. Because, I mean, we're in the ghetto. Like, I don't know thug life. I mean, it was like... Is gang members and drug dealers and homeless people and everything you can imagine. And here I am, white as can be, from you know, Texas, not knowing anything about street life. And I was, I was like, God, how can you use me here? I don't relate to any of these people. I don't understand their life. I don't know what it's like. And I remember God speaking clearly to me. He said, I didn't call you here to relate to people. I called you here to love people. You see, there's a big difference. Jesus couldn't relate to anybody. He was without sin. He couldn't relate to sin. He, he never sinned. But he loved people. You see, when you love people, you make a difference. And that's why Jesus said in John 13, a new command I give you. Can I be honest with you? This wasn't new. This has been around since the book of Genesis. It's all throughout the Bible. The only reason Jesus said it was new is because nobody was doing it. He said, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Let me give you a key to the Bible. Anytime you see the same phrase three times in one passage of scripture, pay attention. That's not accident. That's very, very intentional writing. Jesus was very intentional, including those three words, three times in a row. He's trying to emphasize and drill it home. The third was the face of the eagle, the face of excellence. The eagle is excellent. I don't know if you've ever seen a bald eagle in nature. There's nothing more beautiful or majestic. A number of years ago, Amanda and I were, were in Washington State. And we were on one of those whale watching excursions and we were driving around out by the islands. And the captain of the ship came on the radio and said, if you look over in the distance on the island, on the top of the hill there, you see a bald eagle perched in the tree. If you've never seen a bald eagle in the wild, it, it is the most breathtaking sight. I mean, shoulders back, the look of pride. And all of a sudden, the eagle began to fly. And I'm telling you, everyone on that, there was silence on the boat. Everybody just, they, every, took a step back and it, it literally takes your breath away. 
Just the sight of this majestic bird, the excellence, just the way it flew. Can I tell you that's exactly what God wants for you? That's how God wants you to live your life. God wants you to live your life in such a way that it takes people's breath away. That people stand back and they see an excellence about you. They see something about your life that's, that's different. The way you do marriage, the way you parent, the way you conduct yourself at work, the integrity, the character, the way you live, it, it makes people say, wow, look at the way that people don't live like that. There is something, that they take pride in their work. Not, a, not a, a selfish, negative pride, but a healthy pride in, in their God and who they are and their standards and their excellence and the way they live their life. You know, one of the things we teach our staff around here is a theory called uh, broken windows. It was developed by a sociologist. A sociologist took a car and put it in a certain neighborhood and left it unattended for three days. After three days, the car was left alone, not, nothing. I mean, it was just, it was still sitting there exactly as they left it. So they took the car, they broke out one of the rear passenger windows, and then they put it back in that neighborhood on another street, and they left it again for three days. At the end of the second three days, the car had completely been vandalized, violated, stripped, busted out, things stolen out of it. What was the difference? As long as the car looked like somebody cared for it, everybody left it alone. As soon as it looked like nobody cared for it, no one else cared for it. You see, we teach our staff, look for broken windows around here. If you see a piece of trash on the ground, pick it up. If it looks like we don't care for the church, nobody else is going to care for the church. If it looks like we don't, we don't take pride in what God has given us, no one else is going to take pride in what God has given us. And that's why I love our dream team, because they have a spirit of excellence. They show up early. They get the cones set out in line and, and get the sign set up and the kids building clean and neat and excellent in every way in the cafe and the bathrooms. And they do everything with excellence, a spirit of excellence because it's a wow factor. And we've had people join our church as a result. I, I've gotten comment cards from people. I've never been somewhere with such a spirit of excellence. The way they, the way they cared for me, the way they, they were ready for me. You know, the coffee was ready when I showed up. That just, it made me feel loved because, it, you know, they, they weren't scrambling, you know, to help me. They, they, were, they expected me. There's a spirit of excellence in what they do. This is exactly what elevated Daniel. It's what they said about Jesus. Look, look what they said about Jesus. They were completely amazed, and they said it again and again. Everything he does is wonderful. Everything he does, it's wonderful. The way he, it's wonderful. The way, it's wonderful. There's an excellent spirit about him. And that's why Jesus tells us, you are the salt of the earth. Salt makes things taste better. If the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. Light makes things brighter. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, in the same way that a light lights up a house, that a, that a city on a hill shines a path, that salt makes things taste better, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. They see that the deeds you do are done in excellence. They're good. They're not just, they're not just done. They're not shabby. They're not poor. They're not second rate. They're good. They're done well. They're done in excellence. And here's what will take place. People are going to glorify your Father in heaven. I want you to know the way you conduct yourself at work is bringing people to Christ or pushing people away from Christ. You may say, well, they don't know I'm a Christian. Don't be, don't be so sure. I'm telling you right now, the way you conduct yourself, the excellent spirit you carry makes a difference for the kingdom of God. It makes a big difference. What would happen if we live this way again? How do we change the world? We do it like Daniel. We do it like Jesus. We love, we serve, we carry an excellent spirit. And then here's the fourth one, the lion, the face of boldness. And this is what we talked about last week. This is what it is to stand firm, 
to be bold about what you believe. We cannot be silent about our faith. We're not to be obnoxious. We're not to be rude. We're not to be judgmental, but we cannot be silent. But here's the thing. If you do the first three, you have the ability to be bold. We can have truth when we live a life of grace. Proverbs says the godly are as bold as lions. This was Daniel. See, when you keep reading in chapter six, the satraps were jealous of Daniel. They didn't like this Jewish kid being put in charge of all of the Persians. And so they tried to find a way to get him killed. So they tricked the king and they came up with a law that said, king, nobody is allowed to pray to anybody but you because they knew the only thing for sure was Daniel was gonna pray to his God no matter what they said. They knew that was the only way they could come against him. So they said, King, make a law that if anyone prays to any God but you, they're going to be thrown into a lion's den and be executed. So the king passed the law. Look how bold Daniel was when he learned about this law. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. He wasn't hiding. He didn't close the window. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to act like he, no, he was, he was keeping it public. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Nothing changed. That's boldness. That's, and he's not doing this in secret. He's living his faith out loud. Windows open, just as he had done before. So here's the question as we close. How then do we respond to culture? How should we respond? When you wrap up these four characteristics of Christ, when you take what the glory of Jesus looks like, the lion, the ox, the eagle, the face of the man, when you put them all together, you develop a person that stands firm and loves well. You develop a person who's full of grace, full of truth. You find someone that will distinguish themselves at work with such exceptional qualities that managers love to promote them. Like, we trust that that person, if we put that person in charge, we're not gonna suffer loss. They have exceptional quality. There's, God's blessing is on their life. Everything we give them to do, they do well. We can trust them with this department. We can trust them with this division. We can, we can promote them to run. Everything they do, they do well. They stand firm and they love well. And that's God's plan. God's plan is to make you more and more like Christ so that you reflect his glory, so that you look like an ox, you look like an eagle, you look like a lion, and you have the face of a man. That's what the world needs. Lead with grace so that we can lovingly present truth. When you do the first three, you can be bold. James puts it like this in closing. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith? So what that you have the truth, but you don't have deeds. You don't have grace. Like, yeah, what you believe is right, but if you don't have grace, can such a faith save them? You're not gonna change the world that way. No one's gonna give their life to Jesus that way. You're not gonna have any influence living that way. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, you can be right, you can have truth, but by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, if it doesn't have love, if it doesn't have grace, it's dead. It'll never work. It'll never bear fruit. Someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. I will show you my truth by my love. I will show you my truth by my grace. I will stand firm and love well. Because let me put it like this. You're not going to scare anybody into heaven. Now you can, you can, you know, tell people how mean and how bad and how angry God is all you want. The meanness of God is never going to draw anybody to him. And unfortunately, there are people out there painting a very ugly view of God, a very distorted view of God. When Paul says very clear, it's his goodness that brings people to him. It's his goodness that causes people to repent. When people see his grace and his mercy that, 
that yes, there is truth, but there is grace to help us through the truth. That's what brings people. So let me close with this thought. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. People don't care about your truth until they know that you have grace. People don't care that you stand firm until they know that you love well. We need both. And if you look at the picture of Jesus, what God wants us to reflect, you will see the balance of grace and truth. As an ox, as a lion, as an eagle in the face of a man. Would you close your eyes with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I pray that as a church we'll get this right. And I know there'll always be a tension of grace and truth, and it'll always get a little messy when you're full of grace and full of truth. And, and sometimes it doesn't always make sense when you're full of grace and you're full of truth. But God, I pray that we would fight for this tension. And I know, God, that it's a lot easier to choose one or the other. There are a lot of Christians out there that they'd rather just choose truth because it's so much easier. And there are a lot of people who'd rather just choose grace because it's so much easier. But you've asked us to stand firm and love well. So we pray that you would use the relationships you bring into our life and we would be strategic about those relationships. We would be intentional about the one another's in our life. We would find our small group of one another's that'll develop us, that you will use to make us more and more like you so that we can reflect the ox. We can reflect the lion. We can reflect the eagle. We can reflect the face of the man to the world that we live in. We will distinguish ourselves with exceptional qualities. And as Daniel did, we will rise to positions of influence in our companies, in our careers, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in all areas of our life. We will not reflect culture. We will set culture. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand with me? If you're here this morning and you need to give your life to Jesus today, you're not a Christian, you're not a Christ follower, can I say God loves you? And Jesus has forgiven you. And all you have to do is receive that gift, receive that forgiveness today. And we would love to pray with you to do it. So during this last song, if you're not a Christ follower and today's the day that you want to give your life to Jesus, I want you to come down during the song. At the end of the song, we'll have a team available for prayer. They would love to pray with you to give your life to Jesus today. And then if you're here today and you just need prayer, I always say, don't pray for yourself by yourself. Yesterday's one year Bible said, if two or three agree in my name for anything on earth, it'll be done. Don't agree by yourself. Get two or three to agree with you. And that's why we provide a prayer team at the end of every service is because we want you to have people that can agree with you in prayer for whatever you're believing God for. So they'll be available during and at the end of the song. Let's worship together.